Hi everyone, happy Internship Research and Co-op Month. Welcome to today's session, Co-ops and How to Find Them. My name is Amalinda Rosito, pronouns she, her, hers, and I am the Associate Director for Programming and Career Everywhere at the Center for Career Development. We have two really great presenters today, Beth Secchi and Dominique Moore. Before I turn it over to them, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We encourage you to participate in today's webinar by asking questions at any time. You should see your attendee interface on the computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join in over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation. They will all be addressed during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Note that today's presentation is being recorded and will be emailed to all webinar registrants within 24 hours. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Beth Secchi, to start off today's presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Beth Secchi. I'm one of the associate directors at the UConn Center for Career Development, and I'm here today to talk to you about co-ops and how to find them. I've been working with UConn's co-op program for about 10 years, and hopefully we'll be able to provide you with a number of answers and information to help you get started as you consider this process. The agenda for today's presentation includes me explaining what is a UConn co-op, how to find opportunities, how to prepare your application materials so you can get that interview, and then what are the next steps once you've secured the opportunity. We're about to start going over what makes a co-op in the overview. I also want to mention that if you have questions at any time, please put them in the chat feature and we will respond at the end of the webinar to you. Thank you. When starting to think about a co-op, there's some questions you have to ask yourself. First and foremost, do you know what a co-op is? And I don't mean that in any insulting way. I'm hoping that some of you are here today because you do know, and I'm expecting there might be some people listening today who really don't know, but they've heard that term. So at UConn, a co-op is an opportunity for you to work full time where you will take a break from your coursework and you will work in a field that's related either to your major or your career interest or maybe both. It's an excellent, excellent opportunity to really immerse yourself into a career interest and see if it is a good fit. What's awesome about co-op is that it is paid and you have to get paid to do a co-op. So it just, it really can amazingly even pay for tuition for a full year. Um, the average co-op student, for example, makes about sixteen to $20,000 in a four to six month period. And that definitely can cover tuition for our in-state students. Now, students who are seeking co-op, there are so many different variations and reasons. Sometimes students are seeking a co-op because they have um, come into UConn with enough credits that they're sort of more advanced and they want to graduate in the four year time period. They don't really want to graduate early and they want to do something productive with their time. So they either do a co-op while they're still a student or let's say they finish in a December term, they can do a co-op in that spring term and then walk in May with the rest of their friends. Other times students will do a co-op because they know it's super advantageous for their major and for their industry. Certain fields absolutely lend themselves more to co-ops than others, but any major is eligible to get a co-op at UConn. And I also want you to think about the reasons why you might be looking for a co-op. A lot of times students are doing them because they know it's an excellent way to get experience, which of course is a very valid reason to do a co-op. However, when you're talking to an employer, I don't know that they're going to be as interested in your reasons. Instead, I want you to think about what reasons the employer might have so you can frame your reasons to fit their needs. Now, as I said in the last slide, when students are thinking about co-op, they often think about why they want to do, which of course is necessary. However, when you're applying for a co-op or when you get that interview, you want to make sure you frame the experience as to why it would be beneficial for the company to hire you. They're not looking at it as, wow, I'm going to give this person an excellent way to get experience for six months. 
No, they're going to say, wow, I have someone who can potentially be a full-time employee for me, and I'm going to start their training six months early and save myself $20,000 in recruiting funds because it is extremely expensive to hire a full-time person. And if they're able to bring you in as a student co-op and then convert you to a full-time role, it just saves the recruiter and the company so much time and money. So truly, you doing a co-op is beneficial to them. Now, of course, you can't go into the experience saying, I'm here to do you a favor, right? That That's not going to go over so well. But I just want you to think about your reasoning when you answer questions, when you fill out your applications, that you're there to help the company. Um, you, of course, hope that you will get something out of it, and it is mutually beneficial, but at the end of the day, a co-op for an employer is there to serve a purpose to get a job done. Now for smaller organizations versus the big corporate entities, they're a little bit more about, let me see how I can help you grow and become um, a really good citizen and ideally help you develop the skills you need for a full-time opportunity because unfortunately they're not going to be able to convert you. But for the larger organizations, for the majority of co-ops, often, not always, but often the goal is to use this co-op almost like a long-term interview and then to, like I said, to be a pipeline to be converted into that full-time position. As I started to mention on an earlier slide, Co-op opportunities last about four to six months, and they are full-time. And at UConn, that means at least 35 hours a week. I do try to make sure students are not working more than 50 hours a week. Co-ops must be paid. They are not for credit, but you are considered a full-time equivalent, or FTE, which means you're allowed to live in housing. If that appeal to you, if you attend one of the campuses and are live on live in student or live on student and then get an opportunity in a city where you'd be commuting from the campus. Sometimes co-ops take place in states outside of Connecticut. Right now we have some co-op students in New York, in Texas, um, in California. So really it, it can be truly almost anywhere. We don't allow though international co-ops. If you want to do something like an international internship, you would work with the Education Abroad Office to make that happen. So Yukon co-ops are only in the United States. The focus really is on full-time employment and not being in school, which is why we discourage you from taking classes. However, students are allowed to take up to six credits if that works out with the co-op schedule, and that can be discussed with the co-op coordinator at UConn in our department, as well as with your employer. You'll be fully immersed in the organization's day-to-day -day functions. You are truly treated like a full-time employee, and as I said earlier, you're often a pipeline into the company hiring. Now, for searching for co-ops, they tend to be advertised in a semester, semester and a half ahead of time. So right now it is February. Absolutely, right now is a great time to look for co-ops for the fall term. But again, they could start as early as June 1 or July 1, or they could start as late as Labor Day weekend and still count as a Yukon co-op. Just a little side note, if you are searching for a co-op, what I want you to do is for the semester that you'd be on co-op, I still want you to register for your classes. And then what happens is once you get an official co-op offer and you work with the Career Center, I'll walk you through the steps to enroll in co-op, but do not take out or withdraw your classes. It's really important that you stay enrolled so you're not considered you know, not a student and get removed from housing or get removed from the UConn status. Um, it's just it's just important to stay enrolled. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Now, as we get started to talk about how to find co-ops, the first thing we're going to discuss is the road to success. There are three roads to success, actually, not just one. And I'm going to go into detail on networking, searching, and preparing those application materials. I'll kind of combine networking and searching together, so think of it as a multi-lane highway, and then we'll go into the application materials. First, we'll talk about searching for opportunities and networking. So as you start to think about your co-op search, I want you to consider the multiple ways you can find the opportunities and think maybe how you found other part-time jobs, how you found internships. Networking is the absolute 100% the best way to find opportunities. Who in your family is interested in what you do for a living, friends of the family, maybe you have fam. Um, Think of your 
teachers, your advisors, your coaches, your classmates, their family. Think of your extended professional network. This is where I want you to consider sort of finding the opportunities as well as discussing them. When you are talking to different friends and family about the decision to do co-op, the natural question will be, oh, what do you think you want to do? So you certainly want to have a well-formed answer stating that you're looking to do a four to six month experience with a blank type of company. And by any chance, have they ever heard of co-op? Do they know anyone who has done it? You'd be surprised how many people will be able to help you once you put the sort of put it out there that you're searching for a co-op. Networking does not need to be anything difficult or tricky. Sometimes the term networking kind of makes people a little nervous. Networking is just a conversation and it's just a way for people to help each other out and move ahead. Now, one of the best ways through networking to get an interview and potentially get hired is to be a referral. So if you happen to have any classmates that are already doing a co-op and it doesn't even have to be at UConn, maybe you have friends at other schools that have done co-op, if that person refers you to their human resources and you get hired, they often will get a financial bonus and employers truly love it. And I don't use the word love lightly. Love it when existing staff refer someone to apply for a position because the person who works there now is putting their reputation on the line by recommending referring someone else. So remember we talked earlier about the financials. It also saves the company or can, can save the company quite a bit of money if they are able to interview and hire someone based on a referral versus having to go through a long process. Now, like I said, I think networking is the ultimate best way. However, sometimes it's a little scary or people feel like they're just not sure where to get started. So of course there are online search engines and company websites. Now through UCOM, we have the Handshake system, which I hope you're all familiar with. And this is where companies and organizations post co-ops and other opportunities. These are organizations that specifically are looking to hire from UCOM because of our excellent reputation and the work that our students do. You can also attend virtual fairs and the internship and co-op fair, which did just happen. However, you can go and handshake to see who attended. So if you did not get the chance to go in person, well, virtually, right? You didn't get the chance to attend live. You can actually still reach back out to the employers, explain that you were unable to attend due to a class conflict or something like that. And you would like to follow up if there's an opportunity to do so. You may also reach out to organizations and contacts directly to create your own experience. So this is important that you think about your value proposition. What can you offer the organization? Remember we talked about the motivations earlier? So you want to do some research on them to see why they would actually benefit by having you work with them. I have seen situations where internships, full-time internships have been offered and the student has applied and said, would you consider converting this to a co-op? Now to an employer, some understand the term co-op and some don't. So if it's just a matter of semantics that they're hiring someone to be a paid full-time intern from August 1 through December 31, by all means know that you can apply for it. And I, in the department, would still consider that a co-op, even if the company calls it a full-time internship. So don't get too hung up on the terms. I'd rather you look more about the opportunities. You could also look at entry-level positions at small companies and reach out to them and indicate, see if they're interested in working with you as a co-op student first. And then maybe they'd be willing to postpone the full-time hiring or they would just be able to consider you as a co-op even though it's a full-time job. And then for all you know, you might get offered the full-time job after graduation. So just don't be um, hesitant to reach out. And again, reach out to us at the Career Center and we're happy to work with you to sort of figure out your unique circumstances and make you be the strongest candidate possible. This image is just a picture of a co-op that's currently in the Handshake system. As you can see, it's for summer 2021. And it has an, a note that says apply externally. So the position has passed already. The deadline was just a couple of days ago, but that doesn't mean there's not more coming. And you can see on the left, some other ones are listed. So know you can definitely search for co-ops through Handshake, as I've said before. You can also look at internships and see if any of them might be able to be converted to a full-time co-op opportunity for yourself. 
in addition to Handshake and all the other, you know, um, search engines like Indeed, we also have information on the career website using the link that's at the pop top of the slide. And you can get to this right from the career.ucom page. And then when you go who we serve, you can go to undergraduates, find an internship or co-op, and it will bring you to this page. Now, these three squares that you see are just the first three on the page. And you can learn more about co-ops when you click the learn more about co-op button. You can find some internships through some other resources that we have and I'll show you on the next slides. And then we also have a guide that you're welcome to browse through just for tips and strategies on being successful in the search. Some of the strategies and resources on this page include the co-op guide, handshake. Now I wanna point out going global Remember earlier I mentioned that our office does not work with international co-ops. However, Going Global also has information within the United States because we're part of you know, the international realm. It's just from the US, we don't always think of it that way. So you might find some cool opportunities in Going Global. And then where it says common search engines, I'm gonna take you to another slide to show you how we have broken that up. We are definitely revisiting this page and we do add some new information on a somewhat regular basis. Ultimately though, you wanna reach out to the career coaches and you, we can talk to you about the different processes. I should have mentioned this earlier. If you are an engineering student looking to do any sort of work in an engineering firm or really just anything, if you're an engineering student, you would actually work with Dana Zeider over in the engineering department. All other majors work with the Career Center. If you are an accounting student who is looking to do the accounting CPA type opportunity, you actually work with Erin Lee. But if you're an accounting student that found a great internship at um, a radio station and has nothing to do with accounting, then you would work with my office. So we do work together. So if you have any questions, you would just contact the Career Center and I will direct you as needed. This is the next page from that looking at national um, national websites as well as um, industry-based ones. So this is just the top of the page where we have it broken up by different industries. So it says agriculture and environment, business, communication. The page continues with a few other categories, government, STEM, etc. And there are some excellent search engines here, very specific to different major, not majors, different industries. So I encourage you to look through here because you might find some and it's a little bit better searching than going into the search engines, which can be really broad and overwhelming. So we're back on our roads for success and now we're going to talk about preparing materials. The first thing I wanna mention is what is involved in an application. At minimum, you will have a resume. Everything else could uh, be included, it could occur. Very often you'll need to have a cover letter and to have three or four references available, that's a separate document, using the same header as your resume and your cover letter. You may also be asked to provide writing samples, your transcript, a portfolio of your work, or something else that's needed for, um, for the opportunity. So you wanna make sure you organize everything you need ahead of time that you come into the Career Center and have a resume review, you have a cover letter review, just to make sure you're really on page. Now, one thing to think about as you start putting together your application material is that you need to tailor and individualize every single application because when you do that, you increase your chances exponentially of being selected for an interview. A generic resume that goes out to 30 companies and isn't unique to each skill set that's being requested by the employer will definitely make your resume go to the no pile. And we don't want that. We want your resume to go to the yes pile. So take your time. Do your research on the different organizations. You'll narrow down who you're going to apply to, and then you'll work with us to really tailor the resume to fit. Now, if you're in one specific industry, your resume will probably pretty be fairly similar from organization to organization, but I'm going to show you in a moment how beneficial it is to tailor the opportunity and to increase your chances of getting selected for that interview. Here's an example of an opportunity that can be a co-op. Now this organization is pretty nice because they actually very clearly state what the requirements are, 
um, what's needed you know for the opportunity they say when it's available they indicate the person needs to do a writing sample they give an email to apply to it and they also have very specific questions talked about that yes and no pile quick way to go to the no pile is not follow directions so be sure you read application materials truly carefully and follow the directions explicitly, answering questions that are offered, submitting materials the way the company wants them submitted so you can get chosen for the opportunity. Now I'm going to show you in a moment a sample resume that of someone who definitely I don't think would get an interview and one that has a better chance of getting an interview and I want you to keep this opportunity in mind. What are the requirements that were needed? So the communication and interpersonal skills, speaking well, having computer skills, maybe some information about the type of opportunity they're seeking. If we look at the top, it says they'll gain experience and assist with different projects, media lists, press clippings, etc. So if I've done those things already, I want to make sure those are reflected on my resume as well. Here are two resumes that look different but are for the same person, Jonathan Husky, and all the information is the same. So the person, Jonathan Husky, was a supervisor at Big Y, and which we see on the left at the top, and then on the other resume on the letter B, it's towards the bottom. Now visually, depending on your preferences, you might like A over B or B over A. This isn't necessarily about the visuals as much as I want to show you the necessity of tailoring, which I'll show you on the next slide. Here we go. You can see how the boxes indicate some differences. So on the one on the left, Jonathan Heskey, the work experience is first, Big Y Supermarket. However, the person is not looking to apply for a retail position or a manager position. They're looking to apply to a public relations co-op. So therefore, as you see on the one on the right, public relations experience is listed first, instead of on the left where all the experiences are just straight chronological. Here, they're chronological by category. So public relations experience is much higher than the work experience at Big Y. Again, not minimizing the work at Big Y. If someone was applying to another retail chain or a project management or a personnel management position, we'd want that Big Y experience near the top. Another difference in Jonathan Husky B is the objective statement that speaks to those skills that were noted in the previous slides as priorities for the role. And some classes are included that match the type of work the person will be doing. In addition, we listed out their leadership experience because that's a special events chairperson and that definitely fits in the world of marketing and PR. Whereas the one on the left, it's listed but there's no bullet point. Finally, the computer skills at the bottom indicate ones that are necessary to do the job, some social media is listed, anything that makes that candidate so much more valuable. Once you've applied for the opportunity, it's definitely appropriate to follow up once, wait a couple weeks, and then send out a note and email to your contact if you have one. Do not say something like, am I being selected for an interview? Instead, you can ask, has my application been received? And can you share the timeline for the opportunity at this time? You will continue to keep applying even after you interview all the way up until you receive a formal offer in writing and you've accepted it. Once you've accepted in writing, you definitely cannot continue to search. That's called, um, that's just inappropriate. And if you did that and then took a second opportunity and canceled on the first, it would be called reneging. And that does not look good for the university and it does not bode well for you because human resources directors and managers tend to remember names of people who have withdrawn after accepting. You want to make sure that your professional connections are up to date, that your LinkedIn profile is current. We use LinkedIn a lot for your networking, etc. So LinkedIn is just another excellent way to stay, stay relevant and current. As you get ready to start, you'll evaluate your, the company culture. You'll look at over your position description. Just make sure you're really prepared for that first day on the role in the role at the job. And if you have any questions about how to prepare, once again, you can always reach out to the Career Center. Let's consider what your next steps are. Part of your next steps 
are staying organized. So it's key to use a chart like this, though it's not exactly laid out the way you might want to lay it out, the information is all there. You just want to keep some sort of system where you can keep track of where you've applied, when you've applied, how you learned at the position, any follow-up um, information that's happened. So when you go back, you're really on top of things and it just truly will help you focus. Now, one tip I want to make is when you start creating your big list of companies to consider. You'll do some target companies, you'll think about them from your LinkedIn connections, from your personal connections, just from your own research. I'd like you to make this master spreadsheet of every organization, company, etc. that you're considering. Then you go through and find out, do they have any co-op opportunities at all? If so, what are the deadlines? Now, if they don't have any at the moment, or you've missed a deadline, but it's an organization that you're still interested in, keep them on your list. Maybe make a new tab or a new spreadsheet for future ones, because at some point you'll be looking for a full-time job. And if the company caught your eye for a co-op, they might also be of interest for a full-time job. So that's why it's important when you first look at, at companies and collect all the information, you don't go straight to that co-op page. You kind of read a little bit of, you make the master list, you read a little about them to make sure you're interested in learning more, you, and then you can kind of see what opportunities they have. Now, additional with staying organized is when do you start searching for your co-op? And it really depends on your industry. Though, those of you that are looking at big corporate organizations will find that you need to start anywhere from six months to even 15, 16 months ahead of time. I've seen opportunities advertised in May of one year that start in September of the following year, so 15 months away. If you're looking for small and mid-sized organizations, you probably can search about six to eight months ahead. Now, if all of a sudden it's June and you don't have one for the fall, do not distress. People unfortunately change their minds and back out, so opportunities get reposted. Or on the positive side, sometimes there's a brand new project that comes up last minute and the company says, oh my gosh, we need a co-op. We need to advertise right now. So there are better times to look for co-ops, but there's really no bad time to look for a co-op. Some other next steps would include, as I've mentioned before, meeting with a member of the career staff. Now, if you just want to talk about the, the search a little bit more and how to get started, you can meet with any of our career coaches using the links. If you already found a co-op and you want to talk about the co-op process and what does it mean for you personally for the next semester, email the co-op staff at careercoop at uconn.edu and either I'll answer or the grad student that works with me will answer and we're happy to talk to you about the steps that are needed. Definitely always encourage you to get your documents critiqued. You know, of course I'm going to encourage you to come to the Career Center, but at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that someone else has looked over your documents before you send them out, just in case you had a typo or a spacing error or anything like that. We don't want that information to go out unless it's 100% accurate. Continue to search through Handshake and other strategic search tools. Some of those niche websites on the internship co-op page, I think you'll find pretty impressive and helpful. And just continue to talk to people about what you want to do. When you put it out there that you're looking to do a co-op and you say it enough to enough people, someone is definitely going to respond back. We have the Husky Mentor Network, you have LinkedIn, Handshake, the career staff, your faculty, your advisors, your classmates, your instructors, you will find people who know of opportunities and when they know that you're searching, people will help you by sending information to you and you're going to make this a commitment, a certain number of hours a week that you're working on the co-op application process. That doesn't mean just sitting at a computer for X hours a week. That means talking about it, doing those networking, having conversations with mentors, etc. You want to do everything you can to be really proactive and make this a, a conscious decision to do a co-op search. And I just want to end again on this before I go to the next slide about some of the benefits. You will find that the benefit of co-op absolutely weighs, outweighs so much and you can still graduate in four years even doing a co-op, even if you didn't come in with credits. You just need to plan ahead of time. Sometimes you have to rearrange your schedule a little bit, maybe take an extra class one semester, but it is truly possible to take that semester and do a co-op and graduate in four years. And as I said earlier, more often than not, co-ops often turn into full-time positions. 
We have some excellent videos where you can learn about co-op as well as the resume process, interviewing, etc. on Career on Demand through the UConn Career Center. So I encourage you to go to career.uconn.edu and click on Career on Demand and watch at your convenience. Thank you so much, Beth. I think the information that you presented on today is going to be really beneficial for anybody who's considering co-op. I'd now like to pass it off to my colleague, Dominique Moore, who's going to be answering all of your questions from today's session. Just a reminder, you still have time to submit questions. Um, we will be here for quite a few more minutes. So if you have questions that uh, continue to come up, please submit them through the questions pane.